Hi guys, good morning. So I'm finally getting around doing the big lecture on the actual chemical process of firing and what actually happens to your mug in the kiln. Um, I really want to go over not just the, the chemistry of it, because for some nerds like me, like I, I just love the stuff, I gobble it up, I think it's so cool. Um, but the important part for everyone, even those of you who don't like chemistry, is um, I will point out during which phases you can have a crack and what you can do to avoid it. So this is actually really important to understand for absolutely everyone who is firing ceramics. So let's get to it. So we start out with clay, right? And then we end up with something that is called bisque. And then this is a fully fired ceramic mug. So these are three separate different substances. They're chemically different from each other. And we need to know what happened in the kiln to make this become this become this. So let's get to it. I actually made a, um, like a little, it's not a PowerPoint because it's on a blackboard, but it's on a whiteboard. Um, but I made a little visual for you guys. And I want to keep it here so that you guys can take a screenshot if you need to. Okay, and you can share it, you can keep it, it's yours, I, you know, don't need to be referenced, um, this is for you guys to use, okay? So let's go through the firing process. So I think I'll keep this up, this is more important than my face. So the first thing that happens to your mug after you've made it is it starts drying, right? It's just sitting there drying on the shelf, and this is... Um, we call it water smoking, and it really happens at all the room temperatures and all the way up to 212 degrees. So this is your first line right here, okay? Um, water smoking is just evaporation of water. There's nothing super special about it. Um, there's not really any heat applied to your water yet, not much of it anyway. Um, you can achieve the same thing just by you know, setting it out in the sun. Um, however, if you don't get all of this water out of your piece before you start going higher in temperature, it will explode. So this goes back to my last video. Um, your, your water, when liquid becomes gas, it expands rapidly. And that is the first explosion you can have in a kiln, is at the very, very beginning, when you get to, you cross that barrier. Now, some people have pointed out it's not exactly 212 degrees, some people pre-soak their kiln a little bit higher, you're right, you're right. This is just, I'm giving you like the bare bones, but yes, sometimes pieces can be pushed a little higher. Some people pre-soak at like 250 or 260. Um, and that's because, especially in electric kilns, the ventilation is not great there. So um, the, your actual piece, especially the very middle of it, is not getting as much heat as um, your thermocouple says. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> that aside, um, so the, that's the very first step in the process is to just dry your piece. That's all we're doing. Then, once we think that it's dry, then we start scaling up. Your second line here. Um, now, of course, the drying happens in between here, right? We don't jump from one to another, it's a process. So the water has been evaporating until we hit here. And at around um, a little bit over 900 degrees to a little bit over 1,000 degrees, you have something called dehydroxylation. Big word. All that means is that your chemically bonded water that is attached to a clay molecule is now being driven off. So why does that happen? Let me show you how it happens. Okay. You'll have to pardon me leaning over. Okay, so do you see this? I'm not going to write the full structure for the kaolin molecule because you'll go crazy. But you have kaolin attached to an OH, and on the other side you have the another OH attached to a kaolin. When you apply heat to these bonds here, what happens is this is going to get broken off. And this is nothing but H2O. That is water. And so what's going to happen here is 
these guys are going to float away and all you have is kaolin bonded by an oxygen to another kaolin and that is a much stronger and shorter bond and that is the process of dehydroxylation which is driving off chemically bonded water that's all it is this is irreversible. This is when your clay is no longer the clay that you've been working with. This process is when it's fully complete and all of your kaolins have done this, there is no going back. Okay, you cannot rehydrate it, you can't make it become clay again. It is no longer clay. Okay. Now, as we continue heating up, you have something called a quartz inversion. We talk about it a lot, and there is a good reason for it. So quartz inversion, and I'm not going to get into like what quartz is, and um, but basically it's a molecule and it likes to invert itself. Okay, we'll just leave it at that. I know my chemistry people are going crazy right now. Just bear with me. <laughs> okay, we'll try to keep this simple. So what happens is um, when this molecule inverts itself, um, your actual clay body is going to have a 1% expansion. 1% is not a lot. But if you go too fast here, you can have a crack. And this is the second time something bad can happen to your piece in the kiln is during this quartz inversion. Okay, Tanya, why do we care? This is when you have to go slow. This is not, you cannot ramp really, really fast past this point. Okay, so this is when you talk about firing, this is when you have to slow down, right? So the first part was here so that it doesn't, the water doesn't explode. The second part is here, so that your quartz doesn't expand your piece and crack it. Great. So moving on, let me make sure I'm pointing the right spot. Okay. So moving on, um, at around like 1300 degrees to like a little bit over 1600 degrees, um, your organics have been burning out. Okay, again, it doesn't happen at that degree. It, it's been happening. So they're all burning out and they're giving off carbon dioxide, okay? Um, your houseplants would probably love that. And the other things that are burning out are fluorine and sulfur dioxides. So these are some of the gases that you might wanna think about when you're running a kiln, especially in the poorly ventilated um, spots, just be mindful. There are gases that are being burned off of your clay, among other things, but these are uh, some of the major culprits. When this process is complete here, you now have a bisque piece, okay? So what that means, bisque, means that your kaolins, your, your um, chemical water have been driven out, your kaolins are chemically bonded to each other, your fluorine, sulfur dioxides, your organics have all been burnt out. So it's kind of this porous like bone structure of what your ceramic piece is going to become eventually. And we call it bisque. We like it porous because that accepts glaze. So when we put glaze on it, it soaks it right in, okay? So if you keep firing past that, at around 1700 degrees or so, now this is all in Fahrenheit, by the way, you guys. <laughs> should probably mention that this is Fahrenheit. Um, so at about 1700 degrees, your silicas start melting. And what happens is the silica that is present in your clay, when it melts, it starts filling in the porous structure that you had after you were done bisque firing. So it kind of just fills everything in and it flows and it forms something we call metakaolin. So that is now we're talking ceramics, okay? It's no longer clay, it's ceramics. When you keep going at um, a bit over 1800 degrees, like um, 1830, 1850 degrees, um, your actual clay crystals are going to start breaking and melting, also filling in that matrix. And it's all becoming very uniform all of a sudden. You keep pushing another 100 degrees, you're going to get something called mollites. Mollites are needle-shaped structures that the molecules of clay form. And what happens is they, they kind of pierce that matrix and they stabilize it and they give it strength. So that is super important for strength. Also, please note that this is where your free silica is released. 
Why do I care about the free silica? Well, at a little bit over 2000 degrees, your free silica is going to, call, to form something called crystallites. That I'm sure you people have heard um, can cause problems. They're not problems by themselves. Okay, all clay bodies are going to have them. What happens is um, later during cooling, so if you go down, I'm gonna skip for a second. If you go down to cooling, those crystallites formed from that free silica, they have something called an inversion and they contract your clay body by 3%. This is big, 3% is a lot. So here, if you go too fast, if you're cooling too fast, people who are opening your kiln at 500 degrees, this is it, this can cause a major crack, okay? If it's taken slow, it's usually not a problem. But again, if you cool really fast, the crystallites up here that form from a free silica, here are going to crack your clay. They're gonna crack your mug. Okay, so um, this is basically, 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 basically the process, okay? I'm going to leave it up here because I think it's a lot of information and it's easier to see it. Uh, feel free to, like I said, screenshot it and just look at it on your own at home. I want to mention something really interesting here. So um, the reason why things get hot in the microwave, do you know how earthenware tends to not do as well in the microwave as stoneware and porcelains? There's a reason for it. Do you know how I said that nothing happens like at a specific temperature? These are all ranges, they're all, it's a process, you know? So that driving off of your chemical water is a process that basically happens all through here, okay? They don't all disappear at once. They start here and they keep going. So your earthenware is usually fired at um, like a little bit past 1800 degrees, you know, you maybe up to 2100 degrees. And at that point, you still have a little bit of the chemical water still bonded to the kaolins. When you put that onto the microwave, the microwave makes the, hot, the, the water molecules vibrate, and that's what makes the mug hot. So if you put an earthenware mug into the microwave, because it still has some of the chemically bonded water, it's going to get hot. It might even crack because of the uneven heat. Um, but this is, this is why it gets hot, and this is why sometimes they crack in the microwave. Where your stone and your porcelain, your stoneware and your porcelain, um, they complete this process. They have no chemical water left whatsoever, if they're, if they're vitrified, of course. Um, and they don't have any water molecules to get hot in the microwave. So your stoneware and your porcelains usually do well in the microwave because of it, while your earthenware does not. As you can see, it's all chemistry. It's all explained by chemistry. This is why it's so important to understand what you're working with and what it actually does, even though sometimes it can make our heads spin a little bit, but it's so worth it. You guys take note of this, um, take a look at this, see the three times where your mugs can crack in the kiln, right, with the water expansion, and then again with the quartz inversion, and again with the crystal light inversion. This is important. This is when you're firing, you want to take it slow. It actually affects how you fire and what you do. Understand the process. <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, I'm done goofing off. I hope this was really helpful. Um, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. I know that I went over very quickly a lot of very complex things. Um, there's probably things that I didn't mention, things that I should have mentioned. Um, my chemistry lovers, put them in the comments. I'll go over it. I'll include them in the video description if, if some of them really need to be added to the video. Um, you know, it's, it's, I really want to give like a six hour lecture on this, but um, you guys would all be asleep. So I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> You guys have a wonderful day. I have to go work. I'll see you later. Take care. Have a good week. Bye-bye.